You asked for it, all right? You asked for it, have some questions. Many, many people have been asking questions. In fact, this week, for some reason, the floodgates were opened, and we got so many more questions coming in, and I'm trying to field all those questions, and um, we got them. If you sent them in via that text phone, phone number, we got them. So um, we're going to try to put as many in each Sunday as possible, and if we don't get to your question, text us again. Hey, you didn't answer my question. And uh, I'll try to send you a direct message. How about that? So here are the questions today. And before I start talking about them, I just want to, just like a little disclaimer. This sermon today is not a real emotional one. Uh, It's very much a teaching type message. Um, So you're not probably going to tear up or, you know, uh, I don't have any jokes planned for you today. Sorry. Uh, But some may just come out. But um, it, I think that this is one of the most important messages you'll ever hear. Because we often, we often do feel, feel, especially in our church environment, our culture, we feel a lot of this. So we feel good about our faith. And we, we love to come on Sunday because we feel, we feel the Lord's presence. And, and it's tangible. And so like we, we get it. We believe it. And we understand it. But then maybe a few days later or a few weeks later or whatever, you see something else, you hear something else, and your, and your faith is challenged. And, and maybe you're not feeling it at the moment, and you're thinking, what do I do with this? Um, you know, this happens at school, at college, around coworkers. You know, they'll start doubting our faith, our religion, our Bible and so uh, here's here some of these questions that you guys ask. So how do we know that the Bible is accurate? So on Easter, in fact, this is a direct question from Easter. You said, Pastor, that there were hundreds of people that saw Jesus after he resurrected. How do we know that? Well, the Bible says it. Uh, well, how do we know the Bible is true? How do we know the Bible is accurate? So I want to... I, I wanna, um, encourage you to take notes today because there's or maybe just take a picture of the screens or whatever you want to do but some of this information will be very important for you if not today at some point in your journey uh some other questions are are statements show us historical evidence found by archaeologists from bible stories uh why were some books rejected and not recognized as a part of the bible you may have heard of uh the gospel of thomas or the book of Enoch, or other books like that. Why are those books not in the Bible? And there are these other 66 books that we call the Bible. How did that all take place? And then some of you have been reading a newer translation, and you might have seen that there's missing verses in that translation. Why, why does my Bible leave those out? Why are those left out? Good question. Why aren't there any verses about Jesus in his teens or his 20s? So basically there's a gap between Jesus at 12 years of age and Jesus at 30 years of age. And there's nothing in the Bible about that gap. So why is that there? And then if we have time, the final one is why don't miracles still happen or do they? All right. So you ready? Let's start by this. Let's start by talking about how the Bible was formed. Many people began to write down and pass on orally stories that actually happened. And so they would write them down on parchment paper. They'd put them in scrolls. These were, some of these were books that people wrote. Some of these were poems that people wrote. Some of these were letters that were written. And as the church got older and older, talking about after Jesus, you know, the church began after Jesus that we have today, uh, Many of these churches in different parts of Asia and Europe began to accept some of these books as Scripture. So they, 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 in their mind, they moved them from just being a letter to being the Word of God. Now, that had happened for thousands of years before Jesus in the Old Testament or the Torah. Uh, that, that's where the Old Testament, you know, uh, writers wrote many, many things. And so when Jesus was here, he would quote these scriptures. He would quote the Torah, uh, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and he would quote that. That's the word of God. So they knew that. They heard it. They read it, taught. And so the Jews accepted the Old Testament 
and these new believers were now accepting new books for the New Testament, but it wasn't called that. It wasn't even called the Bible, and it wasn't even locked in until 382 AD. So 382 years after Jesus was born, the Bible was locked in. The word they use is canonized. They, they took the books and they said, these are the books of the Bible. Now, it took a lot of prayer. It took a lot of fasting. It took us some debate on what books do we accept and what books do we not accept. And so they basically used three criteria to make that decision. And the first one was they would look at a, a piece of literature and they would say, does it have divine qualities to it? Is there beauty to it? Is there power to it? Is there unity? Does it, does it go along with other things that we know about God, his character, uh, the word of God? Does it line up with, you know, in the New Testament books were being debated, does it line up with the Old Testament? Is there synchronicity in this uh, meta narrative of, of God's story? So the divine qualities, they had to, they ha it had to have divine qualities. Then the second criteria was, is this letter, is this book, is this poem, whatever, is it received by most churches? So, they, you know, they knew a lot of church leaders and a lot of different sects of the followers and the faith. And they'd had almost 400 years now of, of history. What books are accepted by churches and not? So, they, you know, it's kind of like uh, people's votes, you know, the, of the whole Christian faith. That was, that was a big deal. But then the third, and this is probably one of the most important criteria, is... Does this book have a connection to an actual apostle? So we want a, we want a book that is, has divine quality to it, that other people, you know, the churches accept. But is there, is there an apostle of the faith that vouches for it or that actually wrote it? And so these criteria and several others were used to narrow it down. And basically they came up with three categories. This is the Bible. These are the books and so now we have a Bible with 66 different individual books inside of it. We have the Bible. So this is the scripture of God. This is what we call the word of God. And then there was another set of books that they did not think were in error. But they thought they're just not, they don't meet all the criteria to be in the Bible. So the Apocrypha is another group of books that are, you know, you can read them, you can research, you can learn from them. They're not scripture, but they're here. Then there's a whole nother set of books that we're just gonna push those aside and you don't need to read those books over there, okay? Um, there were some weird things written. Uh, and, and I think it's important to know that. Now you might read the Bible and go, that's pretty weird already, but it happened. You know, it happened, so they put it in there and it lined up with all the other things. Uh, but there's books like the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Paul, uh, that were not included in the Bible, and uh, they had some things that just didn't match up. And that's really why we don't have that gap of Jesus' life from 13 to 30. It's because there just simply wasn't uh, literature in that span of his lifetime that made the cut. So there were books that talked about him as a child uh, making birds out of clay, and breathing into them, and then the bird would flutter off and fly away. Well, as the, our church fathers would look at that, they'd say That's, that doesn't line up with what we know of Jesus. And um, there, was, there was other stories in these books where um, Jesus got mad at his neighbors, you know, the people that lived next door to Mary and Joseph, and he cursed them, and, and the whole family couldn't speak after that. They, they turned mute. And then another time... Somebody else made him mad, and Jesus cursed this family, and their child died in front of them and shriveled up in front of them. So, so there's, there's a lot out there that's not in the Bible, and it's not in there because it didn't fit what those, uh, those church leaders felt like was the word of God. So they had a lot of scrutiny in it. Um, it took a lot of time, a lot of debate, and even to this day, uh, different sects of Christianity have some have a little different Bible at this point. So, like the Catholic Bible is a little bit longer. They include the apocryphal uh, books in their Bible. The Protestant churches do not. Um, there's other like um, 
the Eastern Orthodox churches uh, have a, a little bit different Bible than the Roman Catholic Church. So I'm not going to go into all that detail. Uh, we could talk for a long time. You know, like there's college courses on all this stuff. So um, this is just to kind of give you a general idea. That's how the Bible was formed. And, um, but it brings us to this next question. How can we trust that what's actually in there is accurate and real? That it actually happened? So I want to give you three uh, handles on this today that will help you know that what is in our Bible actually happened. And it's truthful and it's historical. And um, in fact, the Bible is the most historically accurate ancient book that the world has. Now, that's a pretty bold statement to say. But if you compare the Bible and the manuscripts that we have of the Bible to any other ancient book, it's more accurate. So let me just tell you why. So the first one is our manuscripts that we have of the Bible. We, to this day, have thousands of manuscripts, the paper, the parchment of the Bible that were written within one generation of Jesus in his actual life. So some of these are so old that they, that they were actually uh, in the presence of people that witnessed it with their own eyes. They were eyewitnesses, okay? So that's super important. 50 years after Jesus was born is our earliest manuscript that we have. That's, a, that's not the entire Bible, but it's a part. It's a, it's a part of the Bible that we have, that manuscript. We have thousands of these manuscripts between the year 50 A.D. and 150 A.D. So thousands of those pieces of paper of people that had written it down eyewitness accounts of what actually happened. Now, let's just compare it to one secular character, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar lived 100 years before Jesus. He was born 100 B.C., something like that. And if you were to study Julius Caesar right now, you know, watch the, you know, PBS documentary or whatever, or read a book about it, or maybe your history teachers are t talking to you about Julius Caesar. Man, they talk about Julius Caesar like he's their neighbor, like he lived next door to them. They're so sure of everything, and this is what he did, and this is what happened in Julius Caesar's life, and this is who betrayed him, and da -da -da, all that stuff. Okay, how do we know that? How do we know that happened to him? Uh, well, there are basically four documents. There's the book that he wrote called The Gaelic Wars. So Julius Caesar wrote his own autobiography. And then there's four or five other writers that wrote about Julius Caesar. But let's talk about the manuscripts that we have for Julius Caesar. We have 10. We have 10 earliest manuscripts of him. And the earliest that we can find to this day about him date a thousand years after he lived on the planet. So I want you to think about the difference in how we view him versus how we view Jesus. There's, there's people that think that Jesus didn't even exist on the planet today, and yet the Bible, we have 5,000 pieces of manuscript about the Bible, uh, of the Bible, um, that date from 50 years to 150 years after Jesus. And here's Julius Caesar a thousand years after he was here is our earliest manuscript. So can you just, I hope that just helps you see um, how we can look at the Bible as a historical document and it can make sense to us that it actually happened. These are people that actually saw it happen. Uh, but let's go a step further. Number two is the literary style of the Bible. Now when people read the Bible, they go, oh, well, that's, that's just all allegory. That's just fiction. You know, they just wrote fiction, and it's entertaining, and that's what the Bible is. You would think that because we live in the modern era, and when we read fiction, it kind of looks like the Bible, right? I mean, you read whoever, uh, John Grisham or um, Stephen K uh, King or whoever, fictional book, and man, there's so many details, and you know the color of the walls, and you know what kind of socks they had on. Uh, but when you go back and look at ancient Nonfiction like Beowulf or the Iliad, these books that are super old fictional works, they don't write that way. They don't, that type of ancient literature is not as detailed 
as it is today. So when the Bible writers were writing, they were not writing fiction. They were writing what they saw. They were writing historical facts. So, I mean, you hear in uh, Mark, the fourth chapter, that Jesus was asleep on a cushion in the stern of the boat. Uh, In John 21, it says that Peter was a hundred yards away from Jesus on the on the shore and that when Jesus said cast your notes on the, uh, the your nets on the other side of the boat they caught 153 fish they didn't write fiction like that back in ancient times it wasn't detailed like that because they weren't writing fiction in the bible they were writing historical facts so that's just a really cool way to see how the bible is different from other books in that time period and um, it's, it's awesome to see that we have so many pieces of manuscript that point uh, to that accuracy. But there's a third level that I want to talk to you about today, and that's the archaeological digs that we have found. And uh, you may not know this. Uh, if you've never been over there, you don't realize this, but there's archaeologists digging today in Israel. They, they have their little trowels out and their brushes, and they are going to town in Jerusalem, in the city of David, um, they are, they're digging all over the world, but they're digging in the Holy Land to find biblical things. Now, you may say, well, listen, it, this is 2,000 years later. Why haven't they found it all by now, right? This is a, a little state the size of, uh, you, know, one of our, you know, the state of Israel, the country of Israel, is like Alabama or something. Like, how come, how come they didn't find everything in 2,000 years? Well, just, as an, just for an example, the city of Jerusalem has been conquered 40 times by different uh, countries in different regions. So every time that uh, Jerusalem was attacked and pillaged, they destroyed everything, and there would be a level of sediment over that, and then they would build again. And then it would be ta- attacked. And, they, and so there's 40 layers of different civilizations when you go and tour over there. It's amazing. That's why you could, you could go forever and ever because there's all these different layers of history. Well, they're just now digging down past all the things. They don't want to destroy each layer. Uh, and so they're discovering things that line up perfectly with the Bible. And one of the things that's just really obvious is when you go over to um, Israel, you don't just tour like random cities. You go to Jericho. You go to Nazareth, you go to Jerusalem, you go to Bethlehem. The cities that are in the Bible are actually there. So it's just incredible. In fact, they doubted that Nazareth existed um, uh, even to this day. And they said, oh, that's just, they just made a name up for this town and called it Nazareth just, just so that it could prove the Bible. I want to get to that in a second. But the second one I want to talk to you about is Hezekiah's Tunnel. This is one of the most important archaeological finds um, in Jerusalem, in, in the city between where, uh, like if you see a picture of Jerusalem, you see the big gold dome. Um, that's where the temple of God used to be. And now that's a Muslim thing on top of the Holy Mount there uh, in Jerusalem. But it goes basically from that area down uh, across to the valley um, and Hezekiah, he's an ancient king after David, before Jesus. Hezekiah built a tunnel under the ground, and the Bible gives extreme detail about this tunnel, where it is, how to find it, where to go. Well, they finally, they finally discovered it just a while back, and when we went in 2013, we walked through Hezekiah's tunnel, and it was exactly where the Bible said it was. Now, you cannot do that you can't just uh, like try to recreate uh under the ground something that's fake or false so um i was mentioning nazareth in 2009 they discovered underground a house uh, that was 2000 years old where the city of nazareth today stands 1961 this is a huge discovery in the city of caesarea which is on the Mediterranean Sea in the northern part of Israel. Um, It's a beautiful place. To this day, you can see where the Romans were still there, uh, where they had their chariot races. They have a big um, amphitheater there that you can go to in Caesarea. They discovered a stone 
in Caesarea that says Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. And you may think, well, that's great. The Bible says that. Yeah, well, there's a lot of people that say Pilate didn't ever exist, that the Bible is just a fictional story and that there was no such thing as Pilate. Um, well, when you dig up an ancient stone that's buried levels under the ground, and oh my goodness, it says Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, it starts linking up the Bible's story and validity. Um, also, in that same era, this is not going to be on the screen, but this is a bonus. Um, <laughs> you probably have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was a little kid throwing rocks in the desert. He threw one in a cave, and all of a sudden it made a weird sound. He goes in there, and he finds a clay pot that his, that his rock broke. He goes in there, and he finds ancient scrolls from Jesus' day that have been hidden away in a cave in the middle of, the, of, of Qumran, the desert, right by the Dead Sea. So all these archaeologists come in and all these experts. This is in like the 1940s, 1950s. Uh, they go and they find thousands of scrolls in these pots in this cave. And, when they, and, and they find like complete versions of the book of Isaiah in these pots. They looked at those scrolls of Isaiah from Jesus' time. And they lined them up with the King James Bible. And it's word for word accurate. Um, so it's just absolutely, absolutely incredible. Um, so that's part of the manuscripts I was talking about earlier. And then in 2004, they discovered the Pool of Siloam, uh, where Jesus told the blind man to go wash his eyes in the Pool of Siloam. This is way down below uh, the, the modern city. Uh, we went down there when we toured. And let me just say, we're going back next year, okay? So if you want to go to Jerusalem, Israel, all these places I'm talking about, start saving money right now. It costs about $4,000 to go over there for 10 days. And it's going to be awesome, okay? So start, start stashing some money away in a sock or something somewhere. Go with us. But if you go with us, you'll go to the Pool of Siloam because they discovered it, and it's right where the Bible said. In fact, there's water in there, and uh, you can do whatever you want to with it, all right? It's incredible. So the manuscripts, the literature, the archaeology all come together and really solidify the amazing work of what we call the Bible. And uh, it's something you could trust and something you can base your life on. Uh, but some of you may have been reading newer translations of the Bible and you say, there's scriptures that are left out of this Bible and it's in the King James over here, but it's not in the NIV or the English Standard Version. Why, what, what's the deal here? Um, the reason that is that way is because the King James Version of the Bible was written in the early 1600s. That was the first time that the Bible was translated into English, and they used the best manuscripts they had at the time to translate the Bible, and that is what they translated and put in the King James Bible. Since then, the last 420-some-odd years, we found older manuscripts, and so these newer translations of the Bible are using the older trans the older manuscripts that didn't have those particular verses in there. And so they're just trying to be more accurate, basically, is what they're trying to do. And you may say, well, I, I like those old, I, I like the verses that I read in the King James Version. W what are those verses? How, how do they get in there? And um, scholars think that what has happened is in those early days when the scribes were writing out the Bible, they had, they had to do it by hand. Uh, there was no copy machines, no printing press. So if you had a, if you had a Bible, it's because someone hand wrote it. And uh, they, they had a lot of detail in it. But sometimes uh, they would write in the margin uh, a sort of commentary in order to describe what was going on. And some people think that over time, those commentaries got more fit. And there's not a lot of them. There's just a small handful of these that are noticeable. But one, of, one example is John 5, when there's a man laying by the pool of Bethesda, and he's crippled. And the Bible says that angels would come and stir the waters of the pool of Bethesda. And when the waters were stirred, people could get in and they would be healed. That's what the King James Version says. The, the newer versions say 
when the waters were stirred, he couldn't get in. It leaves out the angels stirred the waters. It just says he couldn't get in when the, when the waters were stirred. So, so this is a good example of them trying to explain probably what happened, what happened. And so don't get caught up in that. Those discrepancies, don't get angry and, you know, pick it against the NIV or whatever. Um, none of these verses change the gospel. None of these verses tell us a different story of who Jesus was. The arc of the Bible is the same, um, and the story of Jesus is the same. It, it doesn't contaminate it or do anything to it. It's just a different, <clears throat> a different version of uh, the translation. All right, so here's the final thought I want to uh, talk to you about today. Why don't miracles still happen, or do they still happen? So, great question. Now, all of these things we're talking about today really point back to evidence. You know, what evidence do we have? And miracles were something that Jesus used to prove himself with and to bring evidence of his deity. Uh, but he says something very interesting in John 14, 12. I'm going to read a verse today. For all of you that were nervous about me not reading a verse, here it is. John 14, 12. I tell you the truth. This is Jesus speaking. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. The same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. So Jesus is going into the heavenly realm with the, the heavenly Father. He's leaving us here. He's saying, you're going to do miracles. You're going to see great things happen. Even greater things than what I have done, you're going to see. And so what's conflicting about that is we can read the Bible and we can read all these stories of miracles and we can think that miracles happened to every single sick person and every single person that had died was brought back to life and it can create a false narrative about what really happened so just to just to kind of give you a better picture there were many many weeks of Jesus's life we don't know anything about um, <clears throat> there was many many ordinary days of Jesus's life that we don't see in the script we see some of them but a lot of a lot of you know I already told you about like uh, almost 20 years of his life that's not in the Bible. And then even in those three superstar years, from 30 to 33, three years of Jesus' life where it's just like incredible, miracles happening. Um, there's even big chunks of those three years that we don't know about. So there's a lot of ordinary things that happen. And, and um, I, I believe in miracles myself because I've seen them with my own eyes. Um, years ago, when we first started the church, there was a, uh, a guy named David that got really, really sick. He was the son of one of our members. And she, his mom called me and said, I need you to go to the hospital, please, and pray for my son, David. He's, he's, he's near death. And so I go to Breckenridge Hospital. I go all the way down to, like, the basement. And um, I go in the highest level of trauma ICU that they have at, at Breckenridge. It's, the, it's, it's where the most serious cases in the entire region go this one trauma center at Breckenridge Hospital so I go all the way down there I go all the way to the end of that hallway there's just beds lined up with curtains I go to the very end I open the curtain and Dave is laying in the bed and he's shaking and he has red boils all over his body that I could see his eyes were rolled back he was on a ventilator he's on a breathing machine and I looked at him and I thought it's too late, you know, like, I, why am I here? And, um, but I heard a still small voice of the Holy Spirit say, pray for him to be healed. And so I laid my hand on the sheet and put it on his leg there under the sheet. And I, I wasn't like a fiery pastor at that point, like spit going everywhere. Lord, bring him up out of this bed. I just didn't have that in me. I just laid my hand on him. I said, Lord, please heal David. You can do this. I believe you can do anything. I believe you can heal David. And I, maybe a 30-second prayer, just very simple, very biblical, just very straightforward. It was so awesome because I knew at that point there was nothing I could do. There was nothing the doctors could do. God was going to get all the glory for this. 
and I took my hand off of his leg, and guess what? He still was shaking. He still had all the boils. And I had to leave out of that curtain going, I don't know what just happened. But he got up out of that hospital bed. He went home in a few weeks. God completely healed his body. And it was an undeniable, supernatural miracle that God, that God did in David's life. It was so incredible. Um, so I believe they happened, but it is really, it is really odd. And I think, well, why did God heal David, but he didn't heal Abel, Valdez? Or why did he heal David, but he didn't heal Noel? Other people that I know that, man, we pray the same way. And it's this mystery. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know why. And I, and I know that God's going to get all the glory when we get to heaven. And we, we see with eyes wide open. But even in Jesus' day, he healed 10 lepers at a leper colony. But the rest of the lepers weren't healed that day. He only healed 10 of those lepers. And then every one of the people that, that Jesus healed died eventually. I mean, even Lazarus, who he raised from the dead, died again. He died twice. And so we are now here, and we, we take that word that he says, John 14, 12, that greater works uh, than these are you going to do. Man, I believe that. And so this is what I pray. Lord, heal them. Lord, bless them. Lord, heal me. And I was taught ra being raised up in the church, man, as long as someone's breathing, we're going to pray for them. As long as there's life, there's hope. We're going to pray for healing. We're going to believe for that. And if God has a different plan and, and they die or they, they remain sick, Lord, I don't get that. I don't understand it, but I put my trust, my faith in you. And you're going to figure this out. And you're going to help us in the middle of this dark, this dark season. So uh, would you stand with me? I want us to pray right now. I want us to go to him in prayer. And we're gonna, and, and we're gonna sing just in a minute. But I want us to, I want us to go to him and, and I, I would love for you just to put your hand on your heart right here. And I want you to know that the greatest evidence you will ever experience about the truth of who God is, is right here. You're touching it. It's you. You, the story that God has done in your life, the story that God has has written about who you are, about, about where should you be right now, man? You should be dead, you should be lost. But God has brought you here. God has a plan for your life and a purpose for your life. And, and you are, the Bible says, you are your own letter. You're a letter that's written to everyone else about who God is. And so I just wanna leave you with that. Lord, Lord, keep painting that picture, keep showing up through me God, keep speaking through my life that I might be an example. Would you just join with me in prayer? And let's pray that prayer and just say, Lord, I want to be an example for you. God, I want to be a, a light to a dark world. Come on, let's be honest with God right now. If, you, if you're far from God, you want to be with Him. Would you just say, Lord, please forgive me of my sin. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I put my trust in you, Jesus. Jesus, I believe in you, and I, I want to walk with you from this day forward. Those of you that are already following after Jesus, just say, Lord, I want, a, I want a deeper walk with you. I want a more rich and meaningful relationship with you, God, that is not fading. It's not going dim, but Lord, it's, it's surging. Lord, I want my relationship with you to be on fire. Let's tell him right now. Yes, Jesus. Yes, we look to you. Yes, we trust in you. Jesus Christ, we believe in you. And right now, I make myself available. Come on, let's tell God. Lord, I open up my mind. I open up my heart for you to fill me with your spirit. God, baptize me with you, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I see the evidence of your
put our hands together this morning. You can be seated for just a moment. God is moving and he's doing something. He's speaking a word this morning to so many of you about his truth, how real he is, how present he is, and how much he loves you. And what an awesome time to just hear what God is wanting to do and say in your life. Can I just pray for you really quick? Let me just pray for you. If you, if you want to close your eyes or bow your heads or lift your hands or and if you're watching online, you just join in with us in this moment. Holy Spirit, right now I know you're doing something, God, and I don't know exactly what, God, but I know that there's people in here and people watching online that you're moving on their hearts. You're speaking to them right now. You're making your way through these aisles with your presence and your truth, with your love, with your hope. We're just so thankful, God, that you would just take a moment to be with us. Speak to us. Restore us. Thank you for the evidence. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your, for your word. Thank you for life and life more abundantly. Thank you for the hope for tomorrow. God, we just surrender it all to you right now. In Jesus' name. Come on, everybody say amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together for Jesus and just what he's doing? I want to tell you right now, if you are experiencing something, maybe your heart is pounding or your legs are, you know, kind of shaking a little bit or, or you're feeling a presence and a peace maybe that you haven't experienced ever or in a long time. I want to tell you two things. Number one, we're going to be here for you after service. We don't want to just push past these moments. We want to respect and honor what God is doing in your life. And so if you need prayer or time, please uh, find someone. Find one of our leaders or, or talk to someone at the hub or maybe find someone down here. We just want to be here for you. Maybe that's not the step that you want to take, but you do want more information or you do want um, to... to um, Maybe talk to a pastor or have a prayer request, whatever it might be. In the seat back in front of you, there's a connection card. And we want to fill that out because our heart and our priority is that you are aware of how you can take your next step in your journey, in your walk of faith. Um, and so if you would take some time and fill it out, you can drop it off with your offering on your way out. Um, but I just believe that God is doing something in here this morning um, and to each and every person each and every individual in their own way. And so let's honor that. Let's lean into that. If you're watching online, same. Please comment. Drop a comment. And we have a whole team ready to respond to you and talk with you, maybe send you a DM or whatever it is that you need so that we can help you as well take that next step. Um, another way that is great to take next steps is to just jump in and get involved. I want to share for just a moment of all the things that we have going on um, over the next few weeks and months. And we'll put a graphic up because, man, our summer is going to be so awesome. Uh, you can look up there at those summer graphics, and I won't get to them all. Um, but I will start because I'm a little biased with tonight. We're having a student event for middle school and high school students, 6th to 12th grade. And when I tell you that these environments are what God is doing and even our junior high and high school student, I am so serious and I am so pumped because we have been experiencing moments with God like this with our teenagers for months now. And um, we're looking forward to having another moment like that tonight. We're going to feed them at 6 o'clock, get them full in their bellies, and then get them full in their spirits at 6.30. And I tell you, we're going to have a good time. But you can see on here that we have First Wednesday coming up at the beginning of May. And coincidentally, it is Cinco de Mayo. Ay, 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 ay. Okay, so it is going to be an amazing time. We're going to have a salsa competition. We're going to be doing so many amazing things. We want you to come. Okay, it is just going to be a family celebration. I'm going to get ready to sing with those mariachis. Come on, somebody, right? It's going to be good. 
on first Wednesday. Also, the first Sunday of May, we're having next steps. Um, we didn't have one in April. So if you're planning on coming in April, we want to remind you that it is the first Sunday of May. We can't wait for you to be there. It's going to be an incredible time. It's a session where you get to know about us. We get to know about you. You learn about the church, and you figure out how to get involved in what's going on here at Promise Land. Because there's so many amazing things, but we cannot do it without you guys. Hey, lastly, I want to give you an opportunity to be generous this morning, to link your heart with the heart of the Father. Whether you're watching online or in person, there's a few ways to give. You can text Promise Land to 73256. You can go to psmchurch.com. You can, um, in the seat back in front of you, there's an envelope specifically for offering where you can get a record of your giving. Just jot some information down. And on your way out, you just drop it in the bins, okay? And so I, my heart this morning is that you would, that God would just uh, lead you to, to sow and to give and to trust him and that we would see amazing things happen in San Marcos because he is a faithful God that's going to do big things. So you can prepare that now. Our ushers are going to get in position. We're going to go ahead and dismiss like we have been from back to front, okay? So please wait your turn if you're up in the front. Just give us a few moments. We do this specifically to maintain social distancing to make sure that everyone feels safe and comfortable. If you're watching online, we love you so much. We're so thankful that you're here. You could be anywhere in the whole world, but you're right here watching Promise Land on a Sunday morning at 1113, and we do not take that for granted. We can't wait till we see you again. We'll be right back here at the same time next week. Again, please comment if there's anything that you need, and we would love to chat with you online. We'll see you guys. We love you.